This is another in our series with um, Arthur Bergeron. Um, today he's going to talk about end of life, after life. And let me tell you a little bit about Arthur. He's been practicing law in Massachusetts for over 30 years. He focuses his practice on elder law, estate planning, probate and trust administration, and land use matters. Art consoles senior citizens and their loved ones regarding elder law and special needs planning, asset protection, and Medicaid planning. He works with individuals in all areas of estate planning, including wills, trusts, durable powers of attorney, health care proxies, and living wills. He's joined today by Sandy Cordoba, RN, a geriatric care manager, and Dr. Michelle Ricard, a geriatrician. Thank you. Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming. Let me see if this is working. Oh, this is great. Um, so the purpose of today's program, uh, so first of all, my name is Arthur Bergeron. Um, um, as was mentioned, I do almost entirely now elder law. I have been practicing for more than 30 years. I'm almost embarrassed to say that's almost 40 years, actually, next year, so that's getting very close. Um, and the reason why I love doing uh, elder law is because uh, more, most of my clients still think I'm young. I always like that part. You know, they still think I'm a kid. I always tell them that, that, uh, in, in, that, uh, that um, so, sooner or later, I'm going to become as forgetful as they are, and they always kind of, they laugh. So with me are, are, two, are two folks who have done presentations. Actually, we did a presentation very much like this about a year ago to the Mass Council on Aging's state um, conference. Uh, Sandy Cordolby uh, from Horizons Geriatric, she and her partner Beth Toomey, who is here also from Martha's Vineyard, uh, has, was an RN and was a nurse for years and actually worked in the VNA and, and uh, directed clinical services at the VNA, if I recall, uh, at Martha's Vineyard, uh, but then decided that this was the market that she really wanted to focus on. Uh, so she and her partner Beth Toomey, uh, was a social worker and former police chief, right, so she really knows what she's doing in terms of social work, um, um, have been doing a practice which is just really wonderful. And I asked Sandy to come up because uh, she is about the best geriatric care manager that I have ever uh, dealt with. Um, Dr. Michelle Ricard uh, works, actually, she's part of the great system. She works in the University of Massachusetts um, system. She, has been, she is now and has always been focused as a geriatrician, and so she, is, she too, focuses on these issues um, all the time. Now, I know that one of the reasons why we decided to do this program is that I, I, I heard that last fall, um, one of the recommended readings for folks here in the system was Atul Gawande's book, um, Being Mortal, which talked, among other things, about some of these issues, which I think are some of the most important issues that people face. Lawyers often don't talk about this a lot um, because there is not a lot of legal kind of documentation that is needed for something like this, but it's probably the most important thing that a lot of people face. Um, now, as I've uh, uh, explained, if you've seen my presentations before, I always talk about my friends Frank and Mary. They're my wonderful couple, um, they, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. And I always tell people, if you get that joke, you're old enough to be my client. So Frank and Mary, their, their goal in life is very simple. They want to die. Uh, in their home and they want to be buried in the backyard and then uh, after they die or once one of them dies they want to make sure the other one uh, has all of their assets they want to make sure that the, that each other that they are safe and they want to make sure that following their death if there's anything left that it goes to peter paul and mary jr so we are not talking about frank or peter or paul or mary jr today we're just talking about mary and the question that we want to talk about is uh, um, well, first of all, if Mary is here, if Mary is here at UMass and she's got trouble, uh, how does she deal with that? How does she deal with those issues? If she's got trouble because she is older or frail or maybe going to die, um, whether she's here or at home or whatever, how does she deal with a lot of those issues? Um, and then how do you deal with her? Um, I would bet that you folks are, are the exceptions, but often when I'm dealing with my older um, uh, clients, their children are, are terrible about not getting or encouraging their parents to do this kind of very basic planning to deal with what happens if the parent really gets sick. And among other things, because they don't want their parents, they don't want to be talking to their parents about, about death 
and they don't want to be talking to him about re being really frail. Oh my, you're not really that old, you know. You still look great, you're 92, but you know, you're terrific. Um, so they, they kind of don't want to deal with these issues. So uh, the purpose of this presentation is just kind of talk through with you some of the issues that get faced by folks who are in that situation and talk about the kinds of conversations that need to be had about that ahead of time. Um, so first, I'm just going to talk very briefly about healthcare proxies, the most important document in all of this. Uh, and then um, Sandy Cordoba is going to talk about the five wishes form, a form which some folks love them, some folks don't, but at least it is a, it is a, way, in, or a, a way in which you can have this kind of conversation with someone you love uh, about the issues that are involved uh, in, in, in kind of end of life planning. So, uh, and then Dr. Ricard is gonna talk about the MOLST form. So how many people here know what MOLST stands for? Raise your hand. Come on. Usually, usually it's nobody because, you know, it's just they've never heard of this. So uh, Dr. Ricard is gonna talk about the MOLST form, the form that the Department of Public Health has said needs to be displacing the so-called DNR form, always ambiguously called the comfort care form, right? which was dealing only with resuscitation issues. Um, and it's really meant to do something much broader than that. And so Dr. Ricard is gonna be going through that form with you. You really wanna know about this. So, healthcare proxies. And this is just healthcare proxies 101. In order for a healthcare proxy to be valid, it has to have been witnessed by two people. Uh, and neither of those people can be the person who is going to be the proxy. Um, it can always be revoked. As a matter of fact, every time you sign a proxy, you are thereby revoking all of your previous proxies. So think about whether your, say if you, your folks have done these healthcare proxies with their attorneys and they've got some things in there regarding maybe how they want to be treated, et cetera. And then they go to the hospital, to the emergency room, and the lady at the triage says, so before you come in, we really want you to sign this healthcare proxy. And so they sign it. And what they just did was they revoked their previous healthcare proxy and all the others, right? So um, what I suggest to folks is once you've signed a healthcare proxy, what you want to do, give it to your doctor, uh, have your doctor scan it in, and then when you're going to the hospital, have them send over or email over a copy of the healthcare proxy or keep a copy of the healthcare proxy, right? Because I mean, I get it as far as the triage folks are concerned, you know, every, people want to be covered. Right, if someone's gonna be coming in here, but you wanna make sure that's, take, that's taken care of. Uh, and speaking of poor attorneys, so I didn't catch the spelling error in the next line. Um, the a healthcare proxy takes effect, E-F-F-E-C-T, <coughs> when your doctor says that you are not able to render healthcare decisions anymore. Uh, and then from then on in, whoever you've named as your proxy makes all your decisions for you. Um, and makes them as if you were there. So if you, if you as the proxy make a decision for an, on, on behalf of somebody, the doctor's options are either, like with the patient themselves, to do it, right, or to resign from the case. They're, they're not, they can't kind of contradict it, right? And they can't go say, well, you need to have a probate court or somebody naming somebody, right? So it takes effect as soon as, as, soon as the doctor declares that you can't make a medical decision. And it stops being in effect as soon as your doctor has said that you're back and that you're, you're well again. By the way, this leads to another issue which I'm just going to mention to you because you're here at a huge medical center, which is um, I often bump into uh, the fact that I've got folks who are here in the hospital and the doctor has activated or the so-called the healthcare proxy by saying that the person in the hospital can't make medical decisions and then been told coming into a hospital, oh, this person can't sign any documents anymore because the healthcare proxy is in effect. Well, that's not true. That's not true, right? Um, because the, the, the healthcare proxy, um, the, what the doctor is saying when he's so-called activating the healthcare proxy is that the person can't make a medical decision. That's different from whether that person has the ability, for example, to sign the healthcare proxy. Right? or to name somebody to make medical decisions for them, or to name somebody that's there because maybe the person who had been the proxy is not around, or to sign other documents. Maybe that person is perfectly competent to say that their son or their daughter or somebody has the ability or they want them to take care of their legal affairs for them, 
by signing a power of attorney, right? There are any number of those of, of, of decisions that they continue to be able to make because the question of whether or not you're able to make a healthcare decision, that's, a, well, as you know, you work here, that's a very complicated decision, right? So I just mentioned that to you because that tends to, that tends to come up here in the hospitals a lot. So one other thing, uh, healthcare proxies can be canceled anytime. Uh, often people will say, well, you know, I don't want to sign this proxy because I want to make sure that nobody can admit me to a nursing home. And I'll say, well, actually, um, if you sign the proxy and the, and the lady who is, you know, the man who is the proxy says that you should be going to this nursing home and you say you don't want to go, the effect of your saying that you don't want to go uh, is to revoke the proxy, actually. Uh, and so you can't be committed to that nursing home unless at that point there is a court order. I always give the story of the, you know, the classic, the, there's, a, there's a meeting in the, in the person's room and there's the patient and there, there's the proxy and there's the doctor and the doctor says to the, pro, and the doctor has, in, has invoked the proxy and said, the patient is not competent to make a decision and says to the proxy, do you want the operation? And the, and the proxy says no. And the person in the room says yes. Well, actually, the effect of her saying yes was that she revoked the proxy, right? Is that it, uh, now, I, I mention that because um, I, I've used this line, maybe you'd heard it before. One, my daughter, one of my daughters is now a lawyer, but when she was younger, she once gave me a T-shirt that said, the good lawyer knows the law, the great lawyer knows the judge. Now, in that particular case, the judge, though, is the doctor. And so, really, the proxy is as good as whatever the doctor says that it is at that time because you know who's going to be going to court. But you should just be aware of the fact that an individual can always kind of cancel out their, their proxy. So you always want to have a proxy and the proxy, the effect of being someone's proxy is that you have the right to override any of the previous decisions that had been made by the individual. So whether that individual signed a five, a, a five wishes form and expressed their desire to be treated in a particular way, whether they signed a most form and expressed their desire to be treated in a particular way, if you're there as the proxy and that particular decision comes up, you can always override all of that. So you should be aware that you have kind of total power. So that's the healthcare proxy. And now I'd like Sandy to come and talk to you a little bit about the five wishes. Right. He knows I'm technologically challenged. Yeah, I'm, so as and much I'm really as, advanced. That's why I was able to do that. <laughs> that's not true. So as much as, you know, um, we've been introduced as a whole bunch of people dealing with elder folks, and we have the elder law attorney, the geriatrician, the geriatric care manager. My other hat, as long, along with being a geriatric care manager, is I've been a hospice nurse for about 21 years. And in hospice, not everyone is elderly as they're getting ready to die. Unfortunately, um, we take care of lots of folks, everything from you know, young kids and up to the elderly. So I want to talk a, a little bit more broadly right now, um, in, in including the five wishes, which is my portion of this, um, about not just elders, because actually, how many of you remember the name Terry Schiavo? Do you remember Terry Schiavo? Terry was a 30-something-year-old woman who was in a devastating car accident and, and was on life support and then ensued an enormous, terrible, gut-wrenching fight between her husband, whom she had apparently had some casual conversations with about, well, if anything ever happened to me, I wouldn't want to be kept alive on machines, versus her parents, who, as you can absolutely understand, were devastated. And as long as Terry was in that bed and warm and they were able to look at her, even though she was being kept alive by machines and her brain waves were pretty much gone, they didn't want the machine shut off. So it isn't, I just want to offer that. It isn't just elders and somebody that knows that they have a terminal diagnosis that should be talking about this stuff. I sit on the um, ethics board of Martha's Vineyard Hospital, and, um, and we talk about November and December being sort of the unofficial healthcare proxy months because families are together at that time for some reason or another. So while your families are all together, perhaps have a conversation. My husband died at 45 years old of a heart attack playing golf. We had not had a conversation about was he to be cremated, was he to, he was 45. So, and, and then it came down to my children and I have, having to try to figure out what to do. So I will forevermore know better and just say, remember Terry Schiavo. 
and the terrible ordeal that all of that family went through and, and have the conversation. So that's what Five Wishes is all about. It's just, it's a way of opening the dialogue about five different, bless you, five different categories of what do you want done? Whether you're in your 30s or whether you're in your 80s or whether you're in your 60s and you have a terminal diagnosis, how do you, how do you want this to go? And you get to decide. And, and it gives the control of what's going to happen to you back to the person that we're focused on at a time that they're losing control of everything. So if, if I get to make any decisions at all in my life, besides getting on a boat very early this morning to come, if I get to make any decisions in my life, I want it to be around what's going to happen, how I'm going to be treated, what's going to happen to me during those last months, days, weeks, that, um, that I want everybody to know what I want them to do with me. So that's what the five wishes is all about. You can find it online. Just Google five wishes. You can register online. It's very hard to, um, it feels a little proprietary to me. I don't like that part, but um, it's kind of hard to print a copy of it. And any hospice, most doctor's offices um, will have copies of it. But you can go online and get copies of it. And they want you to register so that you kind of fill out the forms online and now they've kind of got you. But I did it and I didn't get a ton of junk mail. So it's probably um, worth, worth looking into uh, to do it that way. The most important thing you can do is have the dialogue. Talk to your families about what you want. Do it before you get sick. Do it with your parents um, or your elderly clients way before the diagnosis comes because everybody's kind of more clear-headed. Is it going to change? Probably. But who cares? Get the dialogue started and start having the conversation about it because as Arthur said, the 30 and 40 and 50 year olds don't want to talk to their parents about dying and they're 92. So one of the things that happened to me recently in doing this kind of a discussion with some of my geriatric clients is I have a couple, she's 91, he's 92, and they both look 91 and 92. They don't have anything huge going on, but they're 91 and 92. And, um, and Mrs. said to me, I really think that we should be, you know, looking at this. I think we should be um, dealing with getting this done. And I said, absolutely. So I made an appointment with their two adult children who are both in their 50s, and I sat down with them. He's 92 and he's a psychiatrist, retired, and, um, and she, is, uh, she never worked. She's a, she's a registered nurse, but she never worked. So as we're going through and we're discussing, and Dr. Ricard will talk about the most and what all that means, the shocking thing to the children was is that dad at 92 does not want to be a DNR. He does not. And the reason that he, and of course we are all sitting there like, really? You know, what, what are we going to do? So his reasoning when we sat calmly and explored it a little bit is he said, I want my children to be completely at peace when I die. And I think they need to know they did everything they could. So I want you to try doing everything that you can for a short amount of time. Again, Dr. Ricard will go through the different categories of that. But what an interesting way to approach it. He's 92, and he felt that his children will have a better time and have better closure if they felt like they did something. I offered what we talk about, which is it's a lot harder to turn that machine off than it is to, to never turn it on, but he didn't change his mind. And we congratulated him for being able to be so open about it and talk about it, and his children now understand completely what it is that he wants. The Five Wishes, by the way, has been, has been talked about nationally on CNN, on NBC TV, on the Today Show, Money Magazine, Time Magazine. It's a big deal. Mother Teresa was involved in getting the whole thing started, as you can imagine. Um, picking out, I probably am you did it. a few behind. <laughs> so picking out your health care proxy. This is a big deal. I can't tell you how many times I've been standing in the emergency room or in the ICU with a family and mom came in, she got a pneumonia, we had to intubate her, we got to go find the healthcare proxy because she can't talk. So I need the healthcare proxy to talk about what are we doing next, where are we going, are we shipping her off to the big hospitals in the big city with the big buildings, are we keeping her on the vineyard to die, what are we doing? I go looking for the healthcare proxy, I find it in the file and it's Mr. who died two years ago. Oops. Now what do we do? We go looking for the second one, and it's a daughter that lives in Asia right now. 
True story. So pay attention to the healthcare proxies and make sure that they're up to date. And when you pick the healthcare proxy, it doesn't have to be your spouse. And maybe it shouldn't. Maybe it shouldn't be your spouse. Maybe it should be somebody that's not going to be super, super emotional at that moment. Maybe your spouse wouldn't have the ability to make that decision to turn off that intubation machine if you ended up on one. Maybe that's not fair to put on them. If, if somebody's been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or dementia recently, and you think back two or three years ago, and you made them the healthcare proxy, maybe we need to change the form. If you do go look at the Five Wishes form online, by the way, it says on it, you can simply change it by writing revoked on it and making a new one. I don't think you should do that. Somebody's going to have that old one that you didn't revoke, and some, it's not going to get caught up. So if, you're, if, you're, if you have a will, if you have a health care proxy, and you have a, an attorney, go that route. Because they're going to make sure that everybody gets a copy of the new one. Otherwise, the daughter that you're no longer speaking to now, somebody's going to come up with that one. And, and they're going to go looking for her. So if you are going to change it, or your, resi or your clients, or patients, or whatever you call them, consumers are going to change it, make sure that you go find all the other copies and, and get somebody to help you with that. Because it's not quite as simple as they want you to make it out to be. Am I right about that? So wish number one. Who do I want making decisions for me? We kind of got through that, right? The healthcare proxy. Everybody wants to know who the healthcare proxy is. Where I live on the vineyard, there's an awful lot of times that the healthcare proxy is not on the vineyard. They're in Minnesota. Hopefully they're not in Asia where the time is completely opposite of ours. That's happened to me before. So it should be somebody that can show up, but it doesn't have to be. The most important thing is, is it somebody that is going to have the backbone to fulfill your wishes even if they didn't agree with you. There's always an out-of-town daughter. Always, always, always. I heard Dr. Ricard giggle. There's always an out-of-town daughter who's not on the same page with everybody else. You've got to make sure that you have the discussion and that everybody knows where we're going and what we're doing with this and what you want. And you have to keep having the discussion until everybody gets it. It's, uh, it's your decision. And as long as you're making it clear-mindedly, everybody should respect that. There's so many times that somebody that looks as healthy as all of you are sitting in front of me and telling me that this is what you want because you've just been diagnosed with lung cancer and you probably have a year or so to go, but you're telling me what you want and your daughter standing behind me saying, no, I'm her health care proxy. That's not what we're doing. That doesn't matter. The health care proxy doesn't get to say anything. Well, what that should tell you is you need to ch change your health care proxy because she's not going to do what you want her to do. But she doesn't get to say anything until you can't anymore. So everybody's always calling me, I'm the healthcare proxy, I get, no. Not while mom can still tell me. And again, that's probably not who you want to be your healthcare proxy because they're not going to be able to let you go if you want to go. What kind of medical treatment do I want? Wish number two, oops, sorry. Somebody yell at me if I forget that. What kind of medical treatment do you want? Well, again, let's go back to my little 92-year-old man. He wants everything done. He doesn't mind being put on a breathing machine. He wants everything done. And again, Dr. Ricard will explain the pros and cons of all of that. But it's his, it's his wish. It's what he wants. He wants everything done, and his family now understands that. When you talk about life-sustaining treatment, too, by the way, it isn't always just resuscitation. Everybody thinks. You're going to pound on my chest, you're going to breathe for me, you're going to put me on a machine that's going to pump my heart and it's going to breathe for me. But for some people, life-sustaining treatment might be a blood transfusion. It might be IV an antibiotics. If you are at the very end of your life and you get a urinary tract infection, I want to know. Do you want me to let it become septic and we'll keep you comfortable and we'll get you through it and you'll die? Or do you want us to give you antibiotics to treat that? So it isn't just a matter of resuscitation or not. It's a whole different world. And the most is what that did. The most is, it used to be years ago, the doctor could write on a prescription pad, do not resuscitate. Stick it on the refrigerator, you're done. It's not like that anymore. Now you have to discuss, do you want some dialysis? Do you want resuscitate? A lot of things, Dr. Ricard's going to go through all of that with you. If you do, by the way, have a most 
or a comfort care order, make sure that you have one with you. Because if somebody, the out-of-town daughter, comes in and freaks out and calls 911 because it looks like you're about to die and everybody else is doing great and she's going to call 911, that ambulance crew, if they can't see it, if you can't show it to them, they're going to resuscitate you because they have to. By the way, on the refrigerator, it goes on the refrigerator. Why is that? Because the ambulance companies, that's the protocol that they train their ambulance people to, right? You go in the door, somebody's on the floor, if things are going bad, you know, you're going to look one place on the refrigerator for the form. It's not there that you're going to stop looking because you're busy. So it's going to go any place, it has to go on the refrigerator. I know that sounds stupid, but that's, that's it, okay? Wishes for comfort care. I've yet to meet anybody that says, I don't agree with I want to be treated with dignity while I'm dying. <laughs> everybody wants to be comfortable, and everybody wants to be treated with dignity. Some of the answers to the questions are a little different than we thought they were at times when we talked to folks. I had a lady with ALS, and that's a, that's a tough way to go. Oof, it's tough on everybody. And what she was most worried about is, is making sure that her pain management was exactly what she wanted it to be, but she knew she wasn't going to be able to talk. So what I did is I said, fine, we're going to have a signal. We had already established that she would rather that I make her very sleepy. She understood that she wouldn't be able to talk to her family. I would make her very sleepy in the end when her, if her pain was really bad, but how would she tell me I need more? So we did this. She could move her finger. So I said, Alice, when you do this to me, it's my signal that you're in pain and you need me to help you, and I will help you. So it's all about finding out exactly what, I had another gentleman that was 82 and he was dying of melanoma that was sort of everywhere, and his, you know, this zero to 10 scale that we talk about, is your pain zero or is it 10? Obviously nobody wants to be in the 10 range, and I, most people want to be in the three range where I'm not terribly comfortable, but I'm not zonked out on drugs. And he looked me square in the teeth and he said, I want it to be a seven. That's kind of high end of moderate pain. Really? And he looked at me and says, the only way I know I'm still alive is if I can feel that thing in my back. Don't take that away from me. His wish, his, his idea of comfort, that's what it means. Find out what is their idea of comfort? What do they really want? And make sure that you make it happen. Do they want music playing? Do they want certain candles lit? I had one lady that was 32, and her biggest fear was dying with hairy legs. She wanted me to promise that I would shave her legs every other day, and we did. She wanted certain music playing at the end of her life, and that music was playing as she died. She had, a, it was really actually quite funny, she had a, everything written out step by step as we, how we were supposed to get her ready for the funeral home to pick her up. And she, she, she made me promise we would do it exactly the way she wrote it out. Step one, step two, step three. Well, Lillian was much smarter than the nurse. I was still sort of a wet behind the nurse, the ears nurse at the time. And she had it so that it took us about an hour and a half to get to the bottom of the page where we would finally put her dress on her. And she had chosen a mermaid type dress, something really tight and form fitting that had no zippers. This woman was stiff as you could imagine. And, and she wrote and put this dress on me and then she wrote in parentheses and do not cut the back to get it on me. I'm like, oh, you got me Lillian, you got me. So that's comfort care. It's different for everybody. Find out what it is. What is that pain level? How do we communicate that? Do you want to sleep through it? Or do you want to be awake as much as possible to deal with your family and friends and to be there? Do you want your friends coming by or would you rather be alone? Everybody has different ways. Do you want prayer? Do you want someone praying with you or do you not? My father's idea of that was do not do that to me. Do not, don't come in here and get all sad and start praying on me. That, that, would, that would be a nightmare for me. Don't do it. Everybody's different and they need to be able to choose what they want at that time. I just ran out of paper and I didn't run out of. <laughs> Stay at home? Sometimes not. Sometimes folks don't want to die at home. I don't want to die in this bed that my wife is then going to have to sleep in later. I think that will creep her out. 
She didn't agree, but that's what his wish was. He wanted to go to the hospital at the very end. I don't want to die at home because I don't want to take a chance that my grandchildren will come in. I want to go to the hospital. I don't want to be here. Or I don't ever want to go to the hospital. I'm terrified of going to the hospital because I'm afraid I'll die, die alone. It really is, what is it that you want? Make your wishes known. Do you want to be touched? Do you want your hand held? Some people don't. Some people just not, you know, they, they just don't want that. Other people don't want, please promise me that there will always be someone in this room with me, that I'll never be alone. All right. Where's the cat? Some people want to make sure that their loving cat is with them after death. You'll always remember Lillian's list. Oh, boy. We got the dress on her, but I got to tell you, it was, we were sweating and exhausted at the end of that one. But we did it. And what's more important? What's more important than being able to look at each other at the end of all this and say, we got Lillian exactly the way that she wanted to be in exactly the right order. I had not asked my husband, who was 45, if he wanted to be cremated or buried. I hadn't thought of it. Find out. And then where did the cremains go? I had a couple who had it perfectly well mapped out. The woman was dying of breast cancer. And she said, I'm going to be cremated. My ashes are going on the mantle. When he dies, he will be cremated. Our ashes will be mixed together and put in the memorial garden at the church. A couple years after she died, he looked at me and he said, I don't really like that idea anymore. I'm like, what? Dad. This is my dad. You can't change your mind now. Mom's not here. We can't have a conversation about it. He said, I don't care. That's not what I want. So now what do you do? So I looked at him and I said, all right, how about this? We're going to mix your ashes together and you're going with me. Wherever I go, wherever I'm living, the two of you are going to be with me. He said, that's fine. Because he was the same guy that didn't want anybody praying over him. He certainly did not want to be buried in the memorial garden at the church, but he wouldn't tell my mother that. It's a conversation that we all have to have. And that's what the five wishes is all about. Talk about what you want. Get the out-of-town daughter involved as much as you can. And then when you can't pull it all together, call off. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Um, I remember her. It's just amazing. So a, a, a couple of points. So it, for, for, your, for yourselves, for your older parents, you should find a geriatric care manager, right? You should find, there is, Sandy is the best, but there is a field of people who are, have gone into this, typically who are former nurses or social workers, right? Or current nurses or social workers, um, who are interested in helping people who are older to deal with these issues, right? They're typically not paid through insurance, they're private, unless it's long-term care insurance, but they're, so they're privately paid. But I always tell my clients, this is the best investment you're ever going to make, much better than what you pay me, right? Absolutely. Is, absolutely. <laughs> is, is to pay somebody to help you, somebody who has dealt with this a lot and who has the sensitivity that they can really just help you and your parents or your loved ones kind of figure this stuff out. It's just, it's just really important because it goes beyond, uh, it, it certainly includes many of the issues that Dr. Ricard's about to talk to you about. But it kind of goes beyond that. And you need somebody as part of that conversation who has dealt with this a lot. I mean, how many times do you die, you know? How many times do you know somebody who is dying? Do you go through this set of things? As Sandy kept pointing out, you, there, you keep bumping into things that are counterintuitive. You say, oh, Ma, I couldn't want that. You know, well, you don't know. You don't know, right? And to be able to give them the ability I always tell my, my clients as an elder law attorney, my goal is to help people sleep at night. That's all. You know, once you get older, it's like beyond fame and fortune. You just want to get a good night's sleep, right? So to the extent that you can let them talk about this stuff that they might have thought about a little bit, but they weren't going to tell you. They were going to kind of embarrass, you know. It just really helps them. So now I'd like to, to ask Dr. Ricard, once again, who's been doing this all of her life, uh, dealing with these kinds of issues, to be, to be talking through 
these kinds of crucial issues that are on the most form, so that at the very least, you all walk away here, from here going, ooh, I really need one of those, right? You really need one of those. Dr. Ricard. All right. So this is a copy of the most form. Has anyone seen any of these at all? Or? Good, OK. Um, it's, people call it the, you know, the Massachusetts most form, but actually it stands for Medical Orders for Life Sustaining Treatment, and Massachusetts popped its name on there, so Pennsylvania is the post. It's also known as the Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment, so it does go by different names, but here in Massachusetts uh, is the most. Um, and as was pointed out, it's, it's a way of um, honoring the person's preferences and having this discussion, you know, beforehand with them. Um, Arthur mentioned comfort care forms and DNR, DNI, um, and I remember all those iterations. Um, Who ever named them comfort care forms? The nuttiest. It's crazy. Um, Originally, we just used to get a prescription blank and write DNR in it, the person popped that on the refrigerator. Then they came out with a comfort care form, which was, I totally agree, an absolutely terrible name because it didn't define what it was all about. Um, and, then, um, and then we came out with the, with the MOLST form, which I think uh, addresses a lot of the issues you know, that we need to address. So it's, it's a good format for comprehensive advanced planning and allows people to have control over what they want. Uh, and that's really what it's all about, as was just discussed. You know, you want your wishes carried out, not have somebody from out of state suddenly put wishes on that you, that you don't want. Um, <clears throat> so if you want even more reasons for having a MOLST form, um, in the July issue of the Journal America, of the American Geriatric Society, JAGS, um, there was an article where um, they reviewed 50,000 deaths in Oregon, and 18,000 had what they call a pulsed form. Um, and of those 18,000 um, events, the people were four times more likely to have their wishes honored than if they did not have them. So um, it just shows that, you know, you need that. And as Arthur also pointed out, I was going to mention too, Abul Gawande's book, Being Mortal, is absolutely fantastic. Um, I can't recommend that more highly. So, the most form, and the part A, um, as you can see, does the next one have just the A, or? No, yeah, sort of, okay. So the first one is, um, do you want cardiopulmonary resuscitation? Who here has CPR training? Okay, so you know what, what, uh, what that in, involves, and um, what I tell people, particularly in the geriatric group, is that when you do CPR, as you know, you have to put two inches of compression onto the sternum. Well, if you've ever lent or on a pile of twigs, then you will know what it's like to do two inches of chest compression on someone who is elderly. It sounds horrible, it is horrible, and certainly doesn't add to the quality of life. So I think that's a statistic that people ought to know when they're thinking about themselves or their elderly parents as to whether you want to have CPR or not. Um, there was a Canadian study done uh, where a nursing home was right next to a hospital and they used the same code team. So they were, they were there just, you know, lickety split. And none of those nursing home residents that had CPR done uh, survived more than 30 days. Um, another statistic is that over age 75, only about 15% of people survived the resuscitation effort. That's 15%. They're all intubated in the ICU. And of those, only 15% leave the hospital and none of them go home. They're permanently changed and usually spend the rest of their life in long-term care facility or subacute or whatever. So these are just things to have in mind when you, you see CPR and you see these people get up and they had CPR and then you know two weeks later they're up and, and moving around. These are younger people. These are not older people. And as was also said, even though they're looking good and they're moving around and doing their own thing at 92, <clears throat> I like to bring up the topic of homeostenosis, which means that each body system um, has a reserve. And if you think of working in the middle of that reserve and something happens, you get nudged, but you never reach the end of that reserve. 
But as we get older, that reserve shrinks. So now you're working in the middle, but you don't have any room. So the minute something happens to you, you hit the edge, you go over what that system can do, and all your systems are like that. So you don't have this capacity to bounce back. So even though a 92-year-old may be very health, may look healthy and independent in, in the home, their body systems are shrunk down, so they have less of a capacity to bounce back. So all these things need to be considered when you're talking to someone about whether they want CPR. Um, so, <clears throat> okay, I think that's all I wanted to mention on that. So the next one is um, ventilation and intubation. <coughs> now, as you know, that's usually part and parcel of CPR. Um, so in the event that someone does not want CPR, then I would say then you, you don't want ventilation either. However, if someone has general anesthesia and is intubated, or they have COPD and they're more likely to just have respiratory failure, then it's something that you do have to talk with them about. You know, if your COPD gets really, really bad, do you want to be intubated or not? And that's when you just talk about what it's like to have end-of-life COPD and what the values are for them. Do they want to be kept alive so that they can attend their, you know, grandson's event or something or granddaughter's event down the road? you know, in a week or something like that, and they want to be on that vent for a while. But in general, if someone does not want anything done, and as my elderly people will tell me, when my time comes, I just want to go, then I encourage them to tick off no cardiopulmonary resuscitation and, and no ventilation. Um, there is the capacity to use non-invasive ventilation, as is listed. Um, I don't know if that shows it on the now. Let me just go back. Um, under ventilation, under B, um, bottom right, no non-invasive ventilation or CPAP. I tell people that cannot be done outside of a hospital setting, um, but that is an option, as you know, to put just a mask on and encourage ventilation without actually intubating. Um, so that's sort of a not full ventilation, but but it is some. Um, Okay, transfer to hospital. I, am, I just do nursing home medicine now, with some assisted living. So for me, when I'm talking to my uh, patients and their families about transferring to hospital or not, um, particularly if we've already ticked off DNR, DNI, then I tell them that n nursing homes these days can do virtually everything that you would want a hospital to do for you short of surgery and those sort of things that hospitals do. We can do IVs, we can do IV antibiotics, um, we can take care of them, um, and we can do a whole lot of labs and x-rays and all that kind of stuff. Um, <clears throat> so if someone has some advanced dementia and we know that they don't want to be resuscitated, then we do have a discussion about keeping them comfortable in the nursing home setting. Um, the, where it gets tricky is if someone's in assisted living or home, unless they're on hospice, if someone is having an event at home, you really can't do anything for them. That you can't start IVs, you can't do IV antibiotics, all those kind of things. So it's kind of a moot point, really. They do have to go to the hospital. But in the nursing home setting, um, I can definitely have that discussion with them. And Quite a few of my patients now in the, in the nursing home who have advanced dementia uh, do not hospitalize. Um, with a caveat that if they fall and break a hip and we can't keep them comfortable and we feel that even though they're demented, they're still getting around and enjoying stuff in their limited capacity, they're probably going to be more comfortable if we can nip in there, put a pin in that hip, and then send them back. So that's a little caveat in case of major trauma. So sometimes we, we do have that. So then the rest of the form um, pretty much just involves the signing part um, and either the patient or the healthcare agent or the guardian or whatever signs that, I sign it, and that's page one. All right. <clears throat> On the back side, um, doesn't show the back side of the form, but on the back side, uh, there's a section called F, and that again refers to intubation ventilation, refer to section B, which is on page one. Um, 
non-invasive ventilation, again, refer to page one. And then there are three other items on the back, dialysis, artificial nutrition, and artificial hydration. Um, dialysis is something that a lot of times if the elderly person and their family have made up the decision that they don't want to be resuscitated, they probably don't want dialysis either. Um, but I explained to them that if you're thinking of quality of life, then dialysis involves usually three days going to a dialysis center, usually feeling pretty crappy the day of dialysis, feeling not really well the day before dialysis, so they basically have one day when they feel good on dialysis. Um, so I raised that issue with them and asked them what are they really looking, like, looking at for their quality of life. Um, and for them, they said, I don't want to be running back and forth to a di dialysis center. Uh, and some people say, well, I wouldn't mind doing that for a while. Um, so again, the options are to have no dialysis at all, or to use it totally, or to use it short term. Um, but as was pointed out earlier, you can make the decision to have dialysis, and then when it comes to the point of having it, you can say, no, I don't want it. That's the good thing about the MOLS form, is that it can be changed, even though it's there as a guidance for the healthcare proxy, for the physicians, um, it can be changed. Um, artificial nutrition usually refers to feeding tube, and I'm sure a lot of you are aware now of the, of the data on feeding tubes in end-stage dementia. It does not help them either live any longer or improve the quality of their life. Um, all it does is increase the risk of aspiration, actually, which you maybe think you're trying to prevent by having the food going down into the stomach, but the stomach contents wake up, come up into the throat, and then they aspirate. In addition to the fact of the discomfort, trying to pull the tube out. Um, so um, I do give families that bit of information about what you can accomplish with a feeding tube and what you can't. Um, I've seen elderly, I've seen people, not necessarily elderly people, who've had a major stroke, um, have, a temp, have a feeding tube in, and then because of their not extremely elderly, have been able to come back and start you know, eating again, and then the feeding tube can come out. But that is um, you know, more an unusual situation. And again, looking at my elderly nursing home residents, feeding tubes are not usually something that um, we feel are going to be helpful. Artificial hydration, IV fluids or not, um, and unless someone just absolutely hates getting IVs done, it's something that can be fairly easily done. Putting, putting an IV can be, can be done. Sometimes you can't get in very well, but um, so IV fluids we can do in the nursing home. And again, the families may say, no, we're at a point now where they're really end stage. <coughs> and when it's their time, it's their time. We'll just keep them comfortable. Or they may say, you know, you can use it for a short period of time. Um, so, and again, it, it's, as was pointed out before, it all has to do with what they want for the quality of their life. And I do tell healthcare proxies that it's really, you've been chosen to carry out the wishes of the person for whom you are the proxy. So you really, as, as was pointed out, you really can't come in and say, well, I know they wanted this, but I want to, I want to do that. You know, this is what the person wanted. You are on a bound to follow that um, because that's what they've stated, unless something has come up medically which makes you have to rethink it. But, uh, and I also reassure the families well, when they're making this out for someone that hasn't already made it out, but they say, well, mom and dad talked to us when dad died. I had this the other day that they, we were talking about their mother. And they said, well, when dad died, we kind of talked about this, and we know that mum wouldn't want this, but she never put anything in writing. But now we're nervous about filling this out because now we're making the decision. And I reassured them that you're not making the decision. Mum already told you. Unfortunately, we didn't have a MOLS form then. You're just sort of filling it out for her. This is what she would want if she could tell you. And that took the burden off them that somehow they were making, oh, we're going to kill her or something like that. So, you know, that's, that can be a reassuring thing. Um, I know what I wanted to mention about going to the hospital. Um, going back to, uh, to page one. 
When an elderly person from a nursing home goes into the hospital, or even when an elderly person gets sick in the nursing home, delirium is a very common thing that can happen. And believe me, virtually all my patients get delirium when they come into the hospital and then come back to the nursing home. And that just compounds what they have to come through when they're trying to rehab afterwards. If they're in their own setting, they know the nurses, they know the routine, they know the staff, they are less likely to have a delirium in the nursing home with the acute illness. We'll put them in a hospital, with lights and IVs and tubes and noises, I mean, it's just, it just compounds that. So I do bring that up as an issue of having them stay in the, in the nursing home for care. Um, all right. I, I did want to, this really isn't on the mole form, but brings up about hospice care, and it sort of, again, emphasizes the importance of having what you want happen to you. Um, in the January 19th issue of JAMA, um, there was an article on end-of-life cancer care, and they spoke to bereaved families after the care had happened, and they were saying that um, they were most satisfied if they'd had more than three days of hospice, if they died outside the hospital, and they were not in the intensive care unit within 30 days before dying. And really, one of the ways of enforcing that, if that's the sort of thing you want, separate of having hospice, is to have a most form. So I hope I've given you enough reasons to want a most form and uh, make sure that your loved ones, uh, particularly elderly, have a, lot, have a most form. Okay, thank, thank, thank you very, you very, very much. much. And by the way, we're going to take all, we're going to take questions afterwards. I just want to do I want to do one more thing, um, which is, so you've got somebody who is dying, and you're de you've dealt with all of those other issues, but you're saying to yourself, oh, is there something else that we have to do here, right? Are there any other things that we have to do to get ready for for the fact that the person is going to die? Among other things, are there anything that we can do to avoid the probate process? Um, so I'm going to talk about those a little bit, but in order for you to be able to do anything involving any of that stuff, somebody's got to have a power of attorney to be acting on to be able to act legally on behalf of the person who is now dying and can't sign a, sign a new power of attorney, or is probably not well enough to be able to sign. So here's power of attorney 101. Uh, someone can name someone through a power of attorney to be their agent. There do not have to be any witnesses. There actually doesn't have to be a notary. Uh, you only do that for the fun of it. Um, it, it unless the, the person who, to whom you're giving the power of attorney uh, needs to be able to record a document on your behalf, to sign a deed or a mortgage on your behalf or a dis mortgage discharge, that document does not have to be notarized. But remember, good lawyer knows the law, great lawyer knows the judge. So who is the judge regarding whether a power of attorney is valid? Is it a judge? Well, no. It's the guy at the bank. If you're going to the bank, oh, you know, I want to sign this for my mother. We're doing, oh, well, how do I know this is official? You know, the bank teller says. I got to check with my supervisor. Or we're calling the insurance company, and how do I know this is official? It is amazing to me how many people see a notarization stamp and think, oh, this is really a legal document now. This is really official. So that's the reason why you get them notarized, is so that they'll look good. It, it does not have anything to do with the law. Um, there are a couple of things that you want to have in that power of attorney. Uh, in order to make sure that you're not going to be inhibited, though, in terms of using it. One is a gifting provision. Um, powers of attorney, unless it is specified in the power of attorney that the person um, um, is authorizing someone to make gifts on their behalf, then assets can't be transferred by the person with that power of attorney on behalf of the person who signed it. And that may be just what you're trying to do at the end of life, is to try to make sure that you're shifting assets around so that you don't have to go through the probate process. So because what you're trying to do is get things out of the person's name who is about to die, right? So you may want to kind of um, do that gifting. And you want a power of attorney, ideally, that is specific as to the kinds of power being granted. Um, once again, only to make the person, that, the bank teller or whoever, feel happy, right? You want to be able to show them, oh, look, there's a section here that says, that I can sign checks for this person, or that I can withdraw money, or whatever. So that the person, the, the person who is otherwise going, uh, I don't know if this, I can do this, is going to feel at ease. That's why you want kind of a more detailed power of attorney. So, assuming that you have the ability to do that, uh, one of the goals of the exercise uh, typically is to try, it, especially in cases where people don't have a lot of assets. When I mean, you know, say a lot, say, they, say they've got a house, 
maybe they've got some bank accounts, and, and you know where the assets are supposed to go, right? They're supposed to be going to the kids or to, you know, in the Frank and Mary case, to the spouse. You just want to make sure they get there, right? So what you may want to do is use that power of attorney to especially, I, I'm thinking the car is always a big deal. The, the car is one of the main reasons why people have to waste their time going through a small probate process. Because if you die owning a car in your own name, uh, um, then the ownership of that car has to, has to be figured out. Who owns the car now? Uh, and the only person who can sign on behalf of the dead person uh, is now the person who has been named by the probate court to represent that person. Now, in those cases, oftentimes we'll use a, a so-called informal probate process, uh, a process available if the total assets of, in the estate, uh, not counting the car, are less than $25,000 so that we can get this approved relatively quickly. But still, it's like $1,000. I mean, to get the form done and run over to court and do all of this stuff. So why do you want to do that if you can avoid it? So one of the things you want to do with a car uh, is either transfer the car out of the person's name who was about to die or put it into joint names with someone so that the legal consequence of that person's dying is that that person's interest evaporates, the joint owner is now there, and that's all set. Another thing you want to check um, is life insurance policies. If the person who is dying has life insurance policies. Another one of those little cases that causes these unnecessary probates is, is Frank and Mary, and Mary named Frank, of course, to be her beneficiary, except he's dead. And so no one remembered to change that. And the legal consequence of that, if you have a beneficiary of your life insurance who's dead, is the money goes back into your estate, right? Which means there has to be a probate, often for policies worth $2,000, $5,000. I mean, the cost of the probate is more than the value of the policy, right? So you want to kind of take care of that. And finally, you want to be trying to make sure that whatever was owned by that person individually is now owned jointly by that person together with someone else. Because once again, the legal consequence of joint ownership is that every person, every joint owner owns 100% of the asset. So if one person dies, that interest simply evaporates and the other person becomes the sole owner. So if you get things into joint names, you are thereby probably avoiding the probate process. Um, Post-death issues. Uh, a, real, a piece of trivia here uh, is that the person named on the, health, the person's health care proxy is actually the person in charge of deciding whether any of that person's organs are going to be donated. Who knew? It's a little piece of trivia that came from a fairly recent revision in the healthcare proxy statute, right? So, um, by the way, what that means is if someone dies and you're getting a call, you're the, you're the kind of next of kin or you're the person with the proxy and you're getting a call from the, from the hospital or the organ donation place, the New England uh, Organ Bank, which is located in Waltham, saying they want to talk to you, don't avoid that call. Because if the, if, the, if the remains of the person that we're dealing with are in the hospital, those remains cannot be released to anybody until the organ bank has said to the hospital, it's okay to release those remains because we know that the body doesn't have to come in here for an organ donation, right? So, the, so it's the healthcare proxy who has that power. Regarding the disposition of the remains other than re, for organ donation purposes, the person in charge is now the so-called personal representative. It used to be called the executor or the executrix under the will, if there is a will. If there is a will and the person named as the personal representative is willing to take charge of the remains, then that's who's supposed to take charge of the remains. If there is no will, then it's the next of kin, right? In no special order. Well, I shouldn't say that. The spouse first, if the spouse is dead, it's all the kids. But if the kids fight, there's actually nothing in this law that says how you figure that out. So if you think there could be any of those kinds of issues, do I really want to be cremated? You know, do, you know, do I really want to make sure? Well, you want to make sure that your personal representative named under your will knows what your wishes are and is will willing to enforce all of that. Tangible personal property, um, stuff that doesn't have a title to it. A, a, a tangible personal property, legally, there are three kinds of property. There's real property, that is houses or land, houses attached to land, fixtures attached to houses. Then there's tangible personal property. That's everything else that has its, its own value. This computer, this, the, you know, this table, all that stuff. Your clothes, that's tangible personal property. 
And then there's the rest, cash, stocks, bonds, all that stuff, intangible personal property. So the probate process never really has to deal with tangible personal property because somebody dies, you just divide it up. You know, you just take the property and you divide it up. So unless there's going to be an argument over that, you don't really need to, that's never gonna to have to get dealt with through probate, right? So I'm just, but I'm just mentioning that. It may be, oftentimes someone will say, well, you know, I really, I've, all my assets are in joint names, but, um, you know, do I, do I really need a will? Well, I'll say, well, you know, kind of, you need a will if you think someone's gonna be arguing, you know, but what you could also do is just do a list of how you want your tangible personal property taken care of and trust the fact that that's what your kids are gonna do. If there's gonna be an argument about it, now you've got a problem because there's no will and you should have put it in a will, right? But, but typically, it's just a kind of a handy way to be dealing with those issues. So, uh, as I always tell um, my clients, once again, to older people, the goal of life is to sleep well at night. Uh, hopefully this has helped you think about some of these issues. Um, and, and, and hopefully, it, armed with this information, if you're talking to someone you love, who is older and maybe needing to deal with these issues, you can help them sleep well at night too. Any questions for anybody here, for either of my wonderful guests or for me? If not, could I ask for a round of applause for my wonderful guests? Thank you so much. Uh, well, I look forward to coming back and it was just a lot of fun. Thank you, and we'll be around for a while in case there are any individual questions that you didn't, kind of didn't want to ask in public. Thank you.